another day another video so we are back at it again ah now it's 10 41 let's see how fast we can speed run this paper here so this is actually the paper 22 from the latest may june 2024 uh after looking through all three papers which one of it i did it yesterday okay or the day before i can't keep track uh, that one was pretty easy, but when I looked through the paper today, it was significantly harder. So uh, I will now crown this the hardest paper to for the May June session. Okay, so without further ado, let's get started with the video. Before we start the review of this paper, I wanted to use this time here to put in a shameless plug. Okay. So this video is sponsored by DMF Academy where I wanted to promote my tuition services. So we do offer group tutoring, okay, which will be taught by me on the math and at math subject. So if you're interested, details is in the description. Okay, feel free to click on the link and find out more. Okay, I'll reach out to you personally once you fill in the Google form. So let's get back to it. So this paper here, let's look through the first question. Okay, the temperature at midnight is negative 4. The temperature of the noon is 25. Find the difference between these two temperature. Okay, so please take note that what you have to do is to take the bigger number minus the smaller ones, which it created a plus here, making it 29 instead. So for some students who don't quite understand how this works, what you're supposed to do is to you can look at it as a number line where you have negative 4 to 0 and then you have 25 degree here. So clearly it has a 25 degree gap and between this part there's a uh, 4 Celsius gap. So when you total it up, it will also be 29. Okay, moving on to question 2. There is a fixed charge of 1550 and then 650 for each hour. So there's a two things here. One is the variable cost, one is a fixed cost. So those who actually took accounting should be very familiar with this on how it works, which means regardless of how many hours he works, there's a fixed charge of 1550. And then since he worked for four additional hours, each hour he will charge 655. So all you need to do is to add this up and you will get your answer here of 41.7. Okay, so this is for the second question. So moving on, we have a stem and leaf diagram here. Okay, so the common mistake that students do here is that they accidentally added a comma between the numbers. So please remind yourself do not add anything between them, okay? So just leave some spacing, okay? That should be good enough to remind uh, the examiner that the numbers are split apart, okay? So for the 30 section, I have 36 and 39. Moving on to 41 and 44 and 48, 49. Lastly, we have 52, 54, 57, and 57. So with so, you have done or completed to fill up the stem and lift diagram here. So finding the median is quite straightforward. How it works is you have to backtrack to the center. So what I'm going to do is that I cut off one from the smaller number, then the bigger, smaller, bigger, smaller, bigger, smaller, bigger, smaller bigger and then you have a center of 44 and 48 so please add them up and divide it by two you should end it up as 46 okay so that's it for question three okay we're down on the first page moving on to question four jonah has 750 he spent one fourth of the money on travel some of it on the food so we have to find how much did he spend first okay on travel so 750 times 1 over 4 you will get 
187.5. So to find the money that he spent, what we have to do is to take 750 minus travel minus food equals to 437.5. And when you make food the subject, you will get 750 minus 187.5 and the balance of uh, 437.5. What I did here was I transferred this entire negative to this side, making it a positive number. Meanwhile, the 437.5 was thrown to the front. That would explain why sudden appearance of the negative there. So 750 minus of the 187.5 and the 437.5. Okay, you'll be able to get your food results as 125. If you stop here, then congrats, you fell for the trap. Okay, what they expect from you was actually fraction. Okay, so just please take 125, divide it by 750, then you will get your final answer here which is 1 over 6. Okay, so that's it for question 4. Okay, question 5. They say it takes the same numbers of minutes asking us to find the value. So just take 1117 minus 1030. Please note that there's an invisible gap between them because hours is hours, minutes is minutes. So when you decide to borrow one hour from the front, you will add an additional 60 into it, making it a 77. So 77 minus 30, it should be 47. And please take note that this is not the final answer. It's just additional 47 minutes. So 1218 plus 47, you'll be able to find your answer as 65. Again, it's wrong because minutes is kept at 60. So you actually arrived at 1305 as your final answer. If you were to ask me, I will actually use the 24 hour format because the rest of the numbers there were shown in that particular arrangement. So please follow the existing framework that was there. Two significant figures for question six. So I would zoom in a little bit, highlight the second number, and draw an arrow to the back. The reason why I highlight is because I wanted to remind myself that the numbers will end there, or that's my second significant numbers. Another thing to put into consideration will be your significant figures. Okay, please take note that zero at the front is not counted, making the answer 0 0.046. Next one. Union. Wow, surprise, surprise. It's quite easy here. Union means whatever that the yap will be included as your answer. And that's pretty much it for question seven. Okay, moving on to question eight. They want us to find the value of investment. So this is a trap here. Okay, it, right off the bat, I saw the keyword value of investment. So what this basically tells us is that this amount here comprises the existing 5,000 that you put in and this 700 is the interest earned, okay? So your simple interest formula goes by taking the capital times the amount of year and then the percentage making it 700 as your interest earned. So R over 100 equals to 700 divided by 8 divided by 5,000, you get 0 0.0175. And when you make it the subject, it's going to multiply by 100, hence the results of 1.75% as your question 8 answer. Okay, slightly tricky, okay, but if you're very provision in the percentage chapter or interest specifically, then this question should be quite straightforward and generic. Question nine. Okay, so single transformation A onto B 
this is clearly a enlargement. So I'm going to write down enlargement first to help me to secure the first mark. Okay, then the next thing is tracing the scale factor. Normally I will only check from the vertical line or horizontal line. Okay, so I've chosen this blue part here where I trace from two, it was amplified into four, making the scale factor two. So as f is actually four divided by two equals to two with scale factor of two from the point. Where's the point? That's what we're gonna find now by joining all this corner up they should lead you to one very 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 specific answer let's see where it leads us aha found it so if i draw the line nicely it should lead us to this particular point now okay but you get the idea okay try to do it on the paper with pen and actual pen and pencil you should be able to find the point as one negative one okay so that's pretty much it and then we erase everything again here okay so that i have space to address the second question so for question b they wanted us to translate a by negative four and three so please take note the top part represents changes in x and the bottom is changes in y Basically, it tells us that this dude right here will be shifted by four steps and then went up by three, making the answer looking something like this. Okay, and this right here is my image B. Okay, so remember it's four steps towards the left and then three steps upwards. Okay, the point that I use for my tracing is this top corner and top corner here. Right, so that's pretty much it for question 9. Moving on to question 10. Okay, coming to this question is about standard form and the rule that applies to it is it must be, the dot must be located behind the first digit, making it 1.74. And you have to trace one, two, three, four, five, making it 10 to the power of five. And that's pretty much it for this question. Okay. Moving on to question 11. Hmm. Interesting. Question 11 is actually a probability question in disguise because they gave us a sample size of 40 and three of them actually walk to work. So this is the probability of students, of employees walking to work. So if it's out of a sample size of 1,240 now, you have to take three over 40, okay, multiply it with 1,240, and you actually get the answer as 93 of them. Okay, so 93 of the employees will actually walk to work based on this probability or based on this ratio here. Question 12 shows a right angle triangle. Okay, so Sokatoa. For the subject angle to the 90 degree, this is what we call ADJ. There is clearly a hypotenuse and we'll be using cosine here because of ka. So 8.5 be at the top, 14 at the bottom. So just key in cosine inverse, 8.5 over 14. And we get the results as 52.6 as your final answer. For question 13, it's a very straightforward uh, fraction question. Okay, you were supposed to change it into mixed number, making it 9 over 4 divided by 8. 8 times 1 plus 7 is actually 15. Okay, 9 over 4 times 8 over 15. Simplify it before you proceed with your calculation, making the answer 6 over 5, which results as 1, 1 over 5. 
So the reason why I forced myself not to use calculator is because very likely after the syllabus change for whoever that watches this after uh, this last October November session, okay, moving forward, all the question will be in uh, this type of question will appear only in the non calculator paper. Okay, which is the updated paper too. So please have some preparation not to rely too much on calculator going forward. Okay, next question here. Okay, very important information, which is the zero two, because it tells us that our y intercept is a positive two. And with this information, I would like to set in this as my y2 and x2. This will be my y1 and x1. And from here, I will do the gradient calculation by having y2 minus y1, x2 minus x1, making it 4 over 8, which is 1 over 2. So y equals to 1 over 2, x plus 2. So that's for question 14. Moving on to question 15, bearings. Wow. Okay. So things that I would do or things that I always ask my students to do is to no matter what, ignore the arrow that they draw there. It's completely useless. And I will extend it further to make full use of it. Other things that I always force them to do is to draw out the arrow whether uh, regardless of whether the point will be used or not. So again, in the same structure, adding down all the arrows. Next thing that I would like to do is to uh, dissect the information given. They mentioned that bearing of C from A okay, means that our avatar is standing here trying to look towards C. So this part right here is worth 104 degree. And then how is this going to help us to find the answer? So I'm going to use bearing of B from C. Bearing of B from C. So they want us to trace all the way from here. All right. So first thing first, I'm going to use my alternate angle concept to transfer this 104. Okay, or to remind myself that, oh, this right here is actually 104 because of alternate angle. So the keyword equidistance is very important because it helps to tell us that actually each small part of this triangle here is actually worth 60 degree because of uh, equilateral triangle. So if you know that this is worth 64, it's an indirect reminder that, oh, guys, here is actually worth 40. Hey, this is 60 degree and this is 64. Hey, 44 degree, yes. Oh, really can't brain because right now it's one, uh, 11 already. I've been working all day today on the back-to-back -back lessons. So one full line or one straight line is actually 180 degree. Adding it up, you will get a total of 2 to 4. Okay, so 2 to 4 is my final answer here for this particular bearings. Okay, for bearing of B from C. Moving on, question 16. Ah, oh, halfway through. Yes, let's try to speed run the rest of this. Okay, deceleration between 240 to 320. So please take note that this is basically a trap. Again, please use your uh, gradient formula. It's good enough. Okay, this is actually 240 and 16. So when you run the gradient calculation, it will get 16 minus 0, 240 minus 320, which is the answer as negative 1 over 5. So please, 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 please do not include the negative because 
the, at the start, they already use the term deceleration. This is an indicator that the examiner already know upfront that the answers will turn out to be negative. So when they only want the value, please put in either 1 over 5 or 0 0.2. That will be more than enough. Okay. So the next thing is regarding total distance. Total distance is basically area of this trapezium here. For the bottom part, it's a 320. For the top part, it's a 210. If you're wondering how I get to the 210, it's by having 240 minus 30. The height, however, wasn't given that. You actually need to put in some work to find it. So the height is actually this part right here. And the information was hidden from you. Hey, no, it wasn't hidden at all. What am I doing? It's just 16. Okay, so please just utilize the 16 and you'll be able to get the answer. The formula goes by the top part, top horizontal plus bottom horizontal divided by 2 and times the height of 16. So 210, 320 divided by 2 multiplied by 16, you will get 4240. And if I were to increase the mark, I will even test you to convert it into kilometers. But uh, this right here will just be 4240 meters and that's it. Okay, moving on to question 17. Students who walk to school, students who wear glasses, there's a total of 20 students in the class. 8 walks to school, 3 wear glasses and walk to school at the same time. So the only thing that I can fill in for sure is the 3. 2 do not wear glasses or walk to school. And then there was a total of 8 people who walk to school. This 8 actually covers this entire circle. If 3 of them uh, was an overlap, that means a balance of 5. 5 of them is actually the ones that actually walk to school only with no glasses on. Okay, so the last part is to find the complete wind diagram. To find G only, you will be taking 20 minus 2 minus 3 minus 5, making a balance of 10. And that's pretty much it. Okay, do not add all these arrows into the graph. I'm just explaining, so it's fine for me to leave it here. In exam, try to keep your workings clean, okay, and remove any unnecessary information. Okay, so next thing, draw the tangent. Okay, I didn't expect this to come out because they skipped this kind of question for quite some time already. Okay, let's, uh, for those who don't know how to draw tangent, please take note that what tangent basically means is that you must put your ruler so close to the graph that the gap on both sides is somewhat the same. Then only you draw the line. So it only touches at one very, very specific point. And yeah, so just draw out the line. I've actually readjusted it a little bit. Seems like I draw it out a little bit too close to it. Okay, somewhere around here should be good enough. Okay, that's my tangent. And then they want us to estimate the gradient. That's quite easy as well. Please, please, please always utilize the point that they asked us to draw. So it was curly over here. This is actually a, a gap of two. So when five divided by two, a two divided by five, and then we times three. So this is actually your 5.2. Okay, so we have a first coordinates that goes by 3, 5.2 already. And then apparently my second answer coincidentally landed on exactly 2. So from here, use your gradient calculation. 5.2 minus 0, 3 minus 2. You will get your answer as 5.2 as my tangent okay and that's usually how i advise my students to do it uh do take note that for this kind of question there's a gap that they accept 
okay, as answer. So if your calculation doesn't show you 5.2, it doesn't mean you're wrong. Just that the line that we sketch is a little bit different. All right, next question, question 19. So directly proportional, there's a formula that goes like this. And then when you write it out, you introduce a K there. The K is actually the skill factor that we have to find. Okay, so I put in 3 into it. K remains there. 4 minus 1 is 3 squared. So technically speaking, the 3 will be divided by 9, making it 1 over 3. So this was the updated equation right here with the K replace as 1 over 3. They want us to find the answer when x is 7. So let's put it in. 6 squared is 36. 36 divided by 3 should be 12. So question 19a is actually 12. Okay, question b. M is inversely proportional to the square root of P. Explain what's going to happen to the value of M when the value of P is multiplied by 9. Wow. Uh, I'm just going to make a quick guess here. I'm actually not quite sure how to do this question. And I think I will make a separate video explaining this. But if I were to do it during the exam, because this is also the first time I actually solved the paper, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to assume that m is 1, my k is 1, and my p is 1. Following this ideology, if I were to use or do something like this, wondering what's going to happen to the P, it's going to become 9 because I multiplied by 9. I will actually get a 1 over 3 here. What's going to happen to the M value? This is the answer. So I think that based on this assumption, what happen is that my m is divided by 3. Okay, so some students might argue that let's say if it wasn't 1, what would happen? So I'm going to try some other random values. Okay, I'm going to make a good guess again. Let's say it's 4. Let's say k is some random unknown because I wanted to find a k now actually and assuming that my p was 16 at the same time. Okay, I'm going to find out my k first using the similar method that we used in 19a. So 4 equals to unknown over square root 16. Okay, you actually get 4 right there and the unknown is actually 16. So now that we have k value, I'm going to update the equation once again. We have 16 over square root p. So what they yap right now is that what if the p value of 16 was amplified by 9 or multiplied by 9. So I have to check if the answer turns out to be the same having 16 times 9. It was 4 over 3. So previously, when my m is 4, uh, now it is 4 over 3 if I multiply it by 9. So my assumption was correct. Okay, this is actually solved by using a trial and error here. Uh, quite tricky. This is the first time I see this question over the the years that I've been solving past year, okay? Very, very, very interesting question. You guys should really give this question a try. Question 19, B. Okay, so I also gotten the answer through trial and error. 
And I think if you don't panic and apply what you learn, this question 19 here should be solvable. Okay, it's not too crazy now that you know how it works. You can try out random numbers, not necessary to follow what I did here. But you have to run the comparison from 4 become 4 over 3 is actually divided by 3. Wow, very, very good. Next question, question 20 here. Two parcels are mathematically similar. The larger one has a volume of centimeters cubed and height of 5.2, asking you for the height. So because of the cube, I'm going to use the comparison method, my favorite. I'm going to put the small one on one side. Hey, the large one on one side and then the... Hey, ah, large one on one side, yeah. And then the smaller ones is 3.75. 3 and this is the small height. So to find the small height, what I'm going to do is to have 5.2 times with this while dividing it by AD at the same time. So put in the information and then the bottom part I have this. Making the small height a 3.9. Okay, nothing very special. I'm just using the generic uh, scale factor. This is not really a scale factor. This is mathematically similar. But the method that I used was the comparison way. Okay, so moving on to question 12. Okay, this is equation 1, equation 2. I'm going to sub 2 into 1 because they already help us to rearrange it as a subject. So 4x squared minus 18 plus 3y equals to 13. And then when you make the readjustment, we should be able to get the answer 4 times 18. 72 plus 3x equals to 13. Rearrange it as the subject, making the answer 85. So from here, I'm going to make a good guess here. 4x times x. Uh, 17 and 5? Yeah, 17 and 5. So you get 20x. Oh! Them correct, so just put plus, put minus. You get 4x minus 17, x plus 5 equals to 0. Your x value turns out to be 17 over 4, x equals to negative 5. So, just for safety precaution, I'm going to key in and cross check again. All right, it turns out great. I have negative 5, I have 17 over 4. So please take note that this is not it because they actually want us to sub it back when x equals to negative 5. Your y is actually negative 5 square minus 18. 25 minus 18 turns out to be 7 and the other one is 17 over 4, y equals to 17 over 4 square minus 18. I'm too lazy to calculate at this point. I'm going to use my calculator 17 over 4, square it, and then minus 18. We get 1 over 16. So I have 1 over 16 here and a 7 as my final answer. Okay? So quite tedious, please don't panic and solve it step by step for question 21. Moving on to question 22. Uh, the first one is actually a cubic graph. The second one is a reciprocal. Reciprocal means it's a 1 over x where there's an asymptote at the y grid. For the other one, it's a cubic graph because it has two turning points. Okay. So if you have practiced a lot lately on the past year, this one shouldn't be a challenge. Same goes to the next part where we have sine x. Okay, this is again the generic one, the easiest of them all. They just want us to sketch the basic graph. Okay, so it must be freehand drawings. So if it's a little bit crooked, it should be fine and all good. 
and this is my answer here for B1. And when you make sine x the subject, x equals to sine inverse negative 0 0.4. Key into your calculator. Okay, you'll be able to find your answer right here. When sine is negative, it will be at the third and fourth quadrant where we have ASTC. Okay, so time to use the SSJ method. This right here is the making it the subject. This right here is the sketch. Okay, I'm gonna draw two additional lines, remind myself that I'm tracing to this line from the point zero and here. Okay, so I'm assuming one of the answer is between 180 to 270 and the other answer is 270 to 360. So time to key in the calculator, tracing my negative 0 0.4 that resulted in negative 23.58 okay i'm gonna not use equal sign first because this is not the exact results negative basically tells us that it is going in a different direction and during that direction change it is worth 23.58 and i'm gonna reflect both of this value to these two sides which will help me to find my first answer as 180 plus 23.58. And the second answer is actually 360 minus 23.58. So 180 plus 23.58, you will get 203.58. The second answer is 360 minus 23.58, having a result of 336.42. Okay, please take note that you can now round it up, making it to one decimal place, showing these two different answer. Okay, so I will normally write it at least two decimal points first before any kind of roundings, so that the examiner don't have any excuse to deduct my marks. I even wrote down and sketch out the graph. Okay, the last step is actually the justification. Justification on this finding. Okay, so if you really need help on this topic, please search up the video library. I'm pretty damn sure I uploaded uh, the quadrant topic explanation. If I remember, I'm going to put it in. Okay, I promise. Okay, I swear to God, the other day I saw a comment that a dude was whining about me always mentioned that I will put a link here and there, but I never put it because I'm just doing this thing alone and i really don't have that much time to check it one by one but i'll try to remind myself when i'm editing this hey future you please 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 add in the link ah okay next question question 23 wow why is it getting so challenging and confusing okay uh first thing first i'm gonna force myself to sketch this out they are looking for E, U, F, and specifically everything other than it. Wow. E, U, F, specifically other than it, is actually this part in blue. And then union with S, which means whatever that was ever being shaded is included. So only this, this, this right here is not part of the calculation. So the rest just add it up. 2 plus 1 plus 3 plus 4 plus 5 having a total of 15 okay and then the next question is actually a probability question one student is picked randomly from those who speak spanish so if they put it like this this is a reminder to you that your denominator is fixed on those who speak spanish so if i were to make a quick calculation i will get a 10 there Okay, and then they wanted from this Spanish circle here, who else also speak exactly two languages? The one is deliberately excluded from this process because it covers the person who speak three languages. So from this simplification, it will be one over two. So sorry for keep on changing the answer. 
Okay, uh, it's almost 12. Okay, I can't really brain anymore. Okay, I'm just trying my best to record as much as possible after work. So this question 23 here will result in 1 over 2. And then going forward, okay, we arrive at our last question here. Whew. Okay, first thing first, right off the bat, parallelogram. This again is a reminder to us that this side that you see should be equivalent to the B. So OP is equivalent to QR. Okay, so they yap about M being the midpoint. This is a reminder to us that B is now officially being split into two parts with one side being 1 over 2B. Okay, and then the last part over there, which is OR. OR is B making it uh, follow the ratio of 2 and 1. Uh, this will be two thirds of A and one third of A with this specific direction heading up. Okay, and then they want us for MN. So MN is just MQ and QN from here. MQ is 1 over 2B. QN apparently was a change of direction. Hence the results of two, negative 2 over 3a. Okay, last question of this paper. Uh, Mn was then stretched to reach s and position vector of s. So this question here will revolve around you making the effort to create two separate equations. Okay, one was a direct stretch from this pathway that we have here of OR. So I'm going to put in a skill factor. The X is my skill factor of OR. Meanwhile, the other one will be when we make the effort to connect all the way from OP, PM, and then the skill factor involve the MN. Okay, because they mentioned MN was stretch and OR was stretch. So the equation that you create will often surround these two info given and the skill factor will usually apply only on them. Okay, this is something that you have to keep in mind. Making the answer of OR a XB, okay, just for the sake of convenience, I will write down the information for A as well. I'm just going to put 0A so that I can compare directly later. For OP, however, it's just A followed by half a B for PM and then the Y with our answers earlier of 1 over 2B minus 2 over 3A. So a little bit of rearrangement needed to be worked out here, finding a 1 over 2YB and negative 2 over 3YA. Rearrange it A by A first, if possible. Okay, all this extra work here does matter a lot. That set you apart. Okay, one last thing is your simplification that you learn from your algebra. Because when I put out the A, I will get 1 minus 2 over 3Y. This is the part where a lot of students confuse because they don't know where did the one came from. The one is actually from the A unknown that was a standalone entities at the front just now. For the B part, when I do the same thing, I have half 1 over 2 plus 1 over 2 Y. And then the final, final thing, which is to run the comparison. A compared to A, that's where the zero comes in handy, and then we have a 1 over 2y equals to x. So one last final step, 1 minus 2 over 3y equals to 0, 2 over 3y equals to 1. Okay, if I don't want to confuse you, this is how I would write it. And then my y will actually be 1 divided by 2 over 3, making it 3 over 2. And the red part, I have half plus 
half g over 2y this is actually my red part here again i accidentally skip one extra step okay so when i sub in the y value that i discovered earlier i have 1 over 2 plus 3 over 4. so i'm really, really brain dead right now just let me work this out you will get x as 5 over 4 or 1.25 so this is your final answer here because they want you for position vector of S. Uh, the simpler workings will be this. It's just X of OR. So making the answer X of B, which is 5 over 4B as your final results. Okay, so that's pretty much it for this paper. Okay, so now let me explain why this is the toughest paper two in the major session. First of all, it has this hardest version of a uh, vector question. Okay, that's one of them. Uh, another thing is that was complex will be this question 22 here. If your trigo is very weak, especially a quadrant part, you will struggle in the B part two. And when your function foundation is not strong, okay, this is really putting non MAT students at a disadvantage here. Okay, A1 and 2 is actually some very basic concept from math. Other than that, I would argue 19B specifically. Okay, I would crown this as the toughest question of this paper. Okay, and yeah, that's pretty much it. The rest is, some of the question is tough, but it's not to the extent that it never appeared before. 19B is really the special one here. Okay, so uh, one last shameless plug here. So if you're interested in getting, uh, know more about my tutoring service, okay, the link is in the description. You can fill up the Google form and I will reach out to you accordingly. So that's it for today. I hope you find this video helpful. Bye.